scope of uh, history and law and acts and deeds that um, that you gave everybody tonight. Um, you've been putting it together. Thank you. So, um, okay. I'm going to catch up with a few points that uh, Kelby touched on. Very interesting that he uh, uh, finished up with the bloodline link up to a specific king, King John 1215, signing the Magna Carta. But what he referred to, didn't give explicit detail, was two years earlier, King John was in fear of his mortal soul, and he decided to pay for it. And how do you pay for it when you're a king and you hold lands and titles and hereditaments and, uh, and estates? Well, what he did is he decided that he was going to give it all to that Roman church in exchange for his soul, what he believed was his soul that had to be um, uh, redeemed. And that's what he did. That is why King George, who was a lineal descendant through bloodlines, was known as the arch treasurer and the defender of the faith. Because one of the points in between, between the 1215 period and the uh, 1783 period, I read a book recently, for those of you who are into reading, it's called The Defenders of the Faith. And it was a very interesting uh, period of history in 1520 to 1536. And the Holy Roman Emperor at that time was actually the grandson of Ferdinand and Isabel. His name was Charles V. He was related to the German bloodlines, and he was also obviously related to the Spanish Catholic bloodlines through uh, Isabel and Ferdinand. Now, we know Isabel and Ferdinand from history because they're the ones who supposedly Isabel hocked her jewels and gave to old Chris, Mr. Columbus. There's that name again, Columba, Columbia, no accident. So Chris sailed the ocean blue and quote, unquote, discovered America. Well, he didn't discover it. He already knew it was there because that Roman church and those bloodlines already knew what the world looked like. They had maps. They had historical documents that nobody else on the planet had. So he sent him there so that he could reestablish a claim. And the next year, in 1493, the Pope issued what's called a papal bull, a doctrine, a uh, declaration by the absolute, so-called presumed absolute authority of the Pope, that was called the Doctrine of Discovery. And based on that Doctrine of Discovery, any king or crown that was under the, uh, the coronation of the, of the Pope and the Roman Church, anybody who was working for that crown or that king could plant a flag on land. And if it wasn't already held by one of those kingdoms and crowns up to that point, they could claim it under the Doctrine of Discovery. But ultimately, they were claiming that land under oaths of fealty, which means loyalty, to their king, who in turn was given that descent of kingship by that Roman church. So it all ties together. It all ties together because there are three sovereign city-states on this planet at this time. One is called Vatican City. One is called the City of London. The City of London is where that crown, that crown of England that King John gave to the Roman Church in 13, it's held in trust by the City of London. And, of course, the third one is our friends in Washington, D.C. It's a tripartite control, that triple crown that Kelby talked about, those three six-pointed stars in that uh, design in Washington, D.C., it's a triple crown. Where do we hear that term, triple crown? We hear it in racing. We hear it in, in Roman history, the tripartite Caesars. There were three Caesars once who controlled Rome. It's the same thing. Those city-states, those three sovereign states are those three Caesars holding the world authority. So the crown that was given to the Pope, now held in trust by the city of London, created in a extension of itself through a commercial entity called the British East Indies Company. Long story made short, it is the British East Indies Company that has controlled Washington, D.C. and what existed before then since the Constitution of 1787. 
to ultimately create commercial contracts, as Kelby started with, nexus points of agreement and consent, and, and through that contractual agreement and consent, one steps into jurisdiction. The jurisdiction through Washington, D.C., links anybody who consents to it to the Crown of England, which also has something called the Office of the Exchequer. The Exchequer is the treasurer. That takes us back to that term that George III was referred to as the treasurer, the arch-treasurer of the Roman Church or of the Crown. They're all interrelated. So that's just a couple of points I wanted to tie in there. But the key, most importantly, is that in the Declaration of Independence, there's a phrase called, by the consent of the governed. This is a foundational document that has stood unchallenged and unmitigated for over 200 and, what, about 40 years. The consent of the governed means, really, a contract, an agreement to enter a jurisdiction. And the entirety of that, that complete overview of a historical and legal uh, progression that Kelby gave you and that we've been doing on these calls for many months basically establishes the consent of the governed, whether they're ignorant or knowingly, if you, if you do not timely and properly object and sever a presumption of attachment by consent, then you are presumed to be attached and to be under consent, your own consent. So all of that history and all those legal things, the legal events and those acts that Kelby just went through, basically set it up so that by filtering us out from real knowledge and real understanding, creating an ignorant and uneducated population, we by ignorance, collectively and individually, have consented to this entire structure, this structure of legal, corporate, commercial uh, jurisdiction that we've been talking about. The key here is consent of the governed, because in law there is something called timely and properly objecting, and that's where we're going to lead to now, because Last year in January, February, and March, a small group of people with knowledge of a lot of this, some did not have the knowledge, but they had the passion and the drive and the com compelling understanding that something was inherently rotten, evil, and not right in our country. It was self-evident by the history of the last 10 years, and, and that's all we really needed to see. Something was distinctly happening. So approximately 1,350 people came together. They formed what was called a du jour grand jury with a minimum number of members signing documents coming into a du jour body that is recognized in law called a du jour grand jury in each of the 50 states and essentially by law republics. We constituted a lawful body in all 50 republics. And essentially what was done at the end of March is we made a presentment to the de facto corporate governors of the 50 corporate states. It was non-belligerent. It was neutral. It was being at peace, which we have remained those key things, neutral, non-belligerent, and at peace with everything we're talking about. And presentments of lawful nature were made to those governors and they were told that the republic had been re-embodied by lawful authority of the people and that they were given three days that conforms to their own rules and codes, three days to come into the republic and sign an oath to it, sign an oath to the people. And that's all that was requested. And that was all that was required. The fact is none of them did do that. And in law, as well as in legal codification, statutes and codes of the corporation, after three days, they defaulted. And that led us to the capacity that we then had the ability, the capacity to then establish our own remedy. And that basically is the history from about April 1st of last year 
to this very moment. We did it properly, and we did it lawfully. The history of it, the detail of it has been related in many of these calls. And if you go to the Republic of the United States dot org and you go to the on the top bar with the links to the far right, it says uh, Republic Updates. And there's a draw down menu, and at the bottom there's a uh, the last item is weekly updates, and it has the recordings and all the archives of the Wednesday night calls, the Thursday night calls, and the Sunday night calls that Kelby mentioned earlier. If you're really interested in this and you're interested to be part of history and part of freedom, then I suggest that what you do is you go through those calls systematically with earphones and a computer or a pen and a pad, and you write down every point. In fact, if you wrote down every point Kelby just made, you'd have a month, if not three months, worth of research. And if you systematically look up those words, look up the word hypothecation, look up the Act of 1871, all of this, you're going to find that every single thing that Kelby said tonight and everything we've said in the calls over the last six months is precisely true and accurate. There may be a few nuances that are not quite accurate, uh, you know, word here, word there, whatever. But the entirety of the whole picture is very real and is very documented, uh, documentable, researchable, and it can build your education. If you did that with our calls over the last six months and you took a few months to do that, you'd be very educated and you would wake up. You'd wake up to the fact that if you timely and properly withdraw your consent to something you do not personally, morally, emotionally, spiritually consent to, and you step into the republic, then you have done what law requires. You've severed the presumption. You have severed the consensual agreement and contract and, uh, and attachment to their jurisdiction, and you've stepped into the original organic, de jure, lawful republic of the United States of America. And I'm not going to go into the history of the last 18 months or so. Um, that has been covered in, in those calls that you can find on the archives. Really, in summation, the bottom line is the republic as it has stood now, lawfully re-inhabited for 12, 13 months, because we did start fully doing that around July, August of last year, has never been touched. Now, there's been a few fringe skirmishes. There's been a lot of internal division that we've weathered through, but we have not been touched. Nobody has been arrested. Nobody has been accosted. Nothing has happened. What has happened in the positive sense is world leaders around the globe have come into agreement or contract with the lawful republic. We have the support of dozens and dozens, maybe all the way up to close to 100 nations have been in communication with this republic. They recognize us, and that is all that's required. So one of the things that I've had in the conversation, a couple of conversations the last few days, the last week, that I wanted to share is from our position and our perspective inside the republic, as I talk with the senators, Congress people who represent California and some from other republics, and I talk to some of the national people and whomever I interact with during the daily, weekly flow of this, I am personally getting an experience, having an experience of a very systematic progression of solidification of what we are doing. So what you may not perceive, you may not see yet is coming into focus, it's coming into material manifestation, and it is becoming very real, systematically building the individual republic and the national union. And it's going to take years. Some of those conversations I'm referring to, we've touched on the point that, you know, it's going to take a decade to get through this transition, and that's what we hope it to be, is a peaceful, lawful transition so that a minimum amount of harm or undermining or uncertainty, anxiety, fear is the manner of the day. But it's a transition. And in a transition, some people are going to be hurt. We know that. We are going to try to do everything 
possible to make